Now we're going to begin our discussion on animal form and function, which includes chapters 40 through 50. We'll do this in a series of several videos. And the one thing here to think about as we talk about form and function is how form basically fits function. So we have these different types of animals here that include fish, birds, and mammals who are clearly very different from each other, yet all being aquatic in one way or another, they all have a similar body shape and basically uh, limbs, if you will, geared towards helping them swim. So the bird's wings are its front flippers and basically the forelimb of the, the seal and the dolphin are for swimming as well. Um, with that streamlined body to help them move quickly through the water and in the case of the seal their back legs as sort of a tail flipper um, like the equivalent of the tail fin of the shark. So um, organisms need to do a lot of things in order to survive to uh, keep their metabolism going and so they need to exchange materials with their surroundings. Now if you're a single-celled amoeba you just exchange uh, with uh, the liquid medium in which you're living. But now with animals, we get into multicellular organisms, and so they have a bunch of cells that need to interact with their environment in one way or another. So um, a relatively simple animal like a hydra, which is small and just has a couple cell layers thick, um, it can, like the amoeba, just use diffusion to move things in and out of those cells because it has these this outer layer, layer of cells and this organism does live in water so they can just diffuse with the water around them. And you've got the cells that line the gastrovascular cavity that can just do diffusion with the liquids that enter the mouth. Um, however, when we get into much more, much larger, more complex, and particularly with terrestrial organisms, but also aquatic organisms that are large, we have to have these systems that can um, move things around and provide for all the cells inside that organism. So you'll have a digestive system that takes in food, breaks it down, absorbs the nutrients, and gets rid of, uh, for the most part, solid waste. You have um, a respiratory system that brings air in and out and provides for gas exchange and interacts with the circulatory system um, and then yes you have the circulatory system which interacts with the respiratory system the digestive system um, by moving uh, food around and bodily waste that can be removed those wastes being removed by the excretory system um, so these systems all bring what's needed into the body gets rid of waste materials moves things around to all the cells the food that they need and takes those wastes away. Um, we'll cover these different systems in one way or another throughout these chapters, um, but here they all are. Um, we'll get to the details of them a little later. Okay, let's forward, there we go. Okay, so the different types of tissues you see in animals, epithelial tissues, these are the tissues, these are the cells that are the covering of the organism and also line the passageways that are connected to the outside, the respiratory system, the digestive system, and the extricatory system. The form and function of the cells um, depends on where they are. For example, the outer layer, the epithelium, the skin, is a bunch of many cell layers thick, forming this protective barrier, where on the inside of the body, they tend to be one or relatively few cells, because inside the body they're geared towards the exchange of gases and um, other materials so that you don't want a whole bunch of cells there to have to do that through. So it's just typically one cell layer thick on the inside. Uh, connective tissue, um, including bone and blood, um, tendons and ligaments that, uh, in the case of the um, uh, tendons holding muscle to bone and ligaments holding joints together bone to bone. Um, also fat tissue is involved here. Um, and a very abundant material collagen makes up a large portion of this connective tissue. Um, so very important in animals. Uh, muscle tissue for movement clearly you have the three kinds the skeletal muscle 
which are for the most part voluntary motions, uh, and then cardiac in your heart, smooth muscle that lines your um, some of these passageways in your body, your digestive system, for example, that sort of squeezes these tubes and keeps materials moving along. Cardiac and smooth being uh, involuntary muscles, you don't have to think about them. Nervous tissue, uh, part of the nerve network that uh, is used to send uh, these electrochemical signals around your body, connected to the sensory organisms like your eyes and your nose and your ears, taking information in, and then you have neurons that take the information back out to your extremities to elicit some sort of response. Now, coordinating these systems is very important. Um, the endocrine system is uh, one that um, uh, you're basically your glands and your hormones that send signals around the body. You have these endocrine glands, these particular um, uh, glands, again, that release hormones that are typically sent around through the circulatory system. Um, certain cells in the body have proteins on them that can receive or respond to that signal, and those are the, would be the target cells. Other cells would ignore this. Um, sometimes glands secrete one to another. Other times, again, they take advantage of the circulatory systems for long-distance communication. Um, here are the different glands. Again, we'll go over those in that particular chapter. Nervous system, again, it has its own chapter, but the basic unit being the neuron, um, forming these nerve networks. You have dense clusters of neurons in the central nervous system, including the brain and the spinal column, where information is processed. Then you have the peripheral nervous systems, the neurons and nerve networks that run off the central nervous system, running to the extremities and all the sensory organs. Again, receiving information and then sending information back out through the peripheral nervous system. So we want to keep in mind that when we talk about these different types of uh, tissues, they are typically or often clustered into different types of organs. So organs are structures that consist of at least two or more different kinds of tissues. For example, the stomach has epithelial tissue on the inside. It has some connective tissue, including this blood vessel here. And then you've got some muscle. Um, and so these all work together to churn the what you've consumed up, um, begin digestion of it, and um, also having uh, connective tissue and also some nerve tissue in here, connective tissue to hold it together and nerve tissue to um, sort of monitor what's going on in your stomach and seg the signals back to the central nervous system. So homeostasis is extremely important um, for organisms of all kinds, particularly animals. And so there's sort of two major themes. You can be an endotherm or a warm-blooded animal or an ectotherm. Endotherms have a high metabolism. They attempt to maintain stable conditions, no matter what the external conditions are, um, in particular with temperature. And the fish here being an ectotherm, it uh, will has a relatively slow metabolism, can't generate a lot of its own heat, so it tends to uh, equilibrate with the surrounding temperature. So in the wintertime, Mr. Bass will be quite cool, and in the summertime, he'll warm up and be a bit more active and eat more food. His metabolism will speed up and slow down with his, with his temperature. And so we, being um, endotherms or warm-blooded animals, we have this sort of an internal thermostat inside the hypothalamus and so we monitor our body temperature and for example when we when we're in warm surroundings or we're exercising and we're generating a lot of heat and we're getting hot our body can monitor that and we get this negative feedback that is our body we do things to keep the temperature from going up and so um, we might sweat um, and um, just begin to feel hot. And so we'll look for shade, for example, as a behavioral mechanism. But for the most part, we'll start to sweat. We'll have increased blood flow to the extremities to take that heat away from our body. And on the other side, when you get cold, you'll have less blood flow to the extremities. You'll begin to shiver to generate body heat. Um, your hair will stand on end in response to, in to an attempt to increase the surface layer. Uh, on your body, which doesn't work so well on us since we don't have much hair, but on 
animals with lots of hair, it does work quite well. Again, we use negative feedback to attempt to maintain homeostasis. The temperature goes up, we attempt to bring it back down. We negate that trend. If the temperature goes down, we attempt to bring it back up. Again, we negate the trend. Um, our skin, as we just sort of talked about, that is a good way in which we do that. We have blood vessels running out there. And so when we're hot, we can take heat to our extremities, to our skin, to, be, to dissipate off and to sweat and use evaporative cooling. Um, and the same on the other side, restrict the flow when we're, when we're cold. Um, skin, again, being that protective covering, lots going on here. We've got, again, some connective tissue, some muscle tissue very deep uh, underneath the skin, and then you've got the um, epithelial tissue um, on the outside, this covering. Uh, nerve tissue connected to the hairs that uh, when you rub your hairs, you can feel it. Um, again, these sweat glands. Um, fat tissue here lower down. Um, okay. Here's an interesting thing that we have, particularly with our extremities, countercurrent heat exchange. So we attempt to keep our core relatively warm, like this bird or this dolphin here. And so it's relatively warm uh, in, in the core. As blood flows out to the extremities, it can get to colder and colder parts of our body, particularly in the wintertime with Mr. Canada Goose, if he's standing on an icy lake or in the snow, his feet are going to be quite cold. So it tends to cool down as it's going out. But then what happens, so that's in the arteries flowing out, but then with those veins flowing back, we absorb heat. And so as the blood is flowing back into the core, it's heated up. And so that keeps us from losing too much heat in our extremities and helps us keep the core warm, this countercurrent heat exchange. Important with thermoregulation. Now again, you can do this on the opposite way. You can either um, take heat to the extremities to get rid of it, or you can sort of conserve it, depending on how much blood you have flowing out. Here these sea lions are using their flippers to thermoregulate. In this case, I don't know, are they attempting to absorb heat or dissipate it? I'm not exactly sure. These alligators are clearly sitting out in the sun to absorb heat. They have these black bodies. They get, when the sun comes up, they just lie around and warm up and, until they've absorbed enough heat to become active. <clears throat> the foods we take in, that organisms, animals take in, are, can be used for several um, purposes. Of course, as we take it in, we have to begin digesting it and breaking it down. That process... Um, causes some of that energy to be lost as heat. Um, some of the material we take in is not digested. It just goes straight through us and it has some energy in it. Now that which is digested can be, a lot of it's used to just do cellular work, part of our metabolism. Um, cellular respiration, again, generating ATP. At that point, we, of course, we also lose heat. Uh, Part of the material becomes the raw material to build new things, to replace those skin cells we have to replace, to replace those red blood cells we have to replace, etc. And of course it takes uh, energy in the form of ATP to build up those new things from those raw materials. Um, so you can see there's a lot going on with metabolism. Eventually the energy that comes in it's all ultimately lost, either as just material we don't use or the heat that is lost through metabolic activity. And here we see, okay, that's chapter 40. So we just have some comparisons of these different organisms, these different endotherms and this ectotherm and the amount of energy they dedicate towards certain functions. Um, you can see a relatively large organism has to take in a lot of energy just because it's larger. Um, but the amount of energy it has to actually use per kilogram is a lot less than, say, the mouse, which has a very fast metabolism. Now, of course, you can see it takes in a lot less food, but, of course, it's a much smaller organism, as you can see, but per kilogram, it burns up a lot of energy. It has a very fast metabolism. It dedicates a lot of it to reproduction, as you can see here, relative to uh, the human or the penguin. The ectotherm... Very slow metabolism. Relative to his body weight, he doesn't have to consume a whole lot. Um, again, because he has a doesn't have to expend a lot of energy on his metabolism, or she, I should say. Um, 
compared to us. You can see the basal metabolism is, is much higher.